there's so much to learn within genetics DNA. Um, how are you staying on top of that? Because as I understand, you don't sell data and compare to other companies and kind of, you know, as the pool grows, you learn more and data comes out more, right? That's part of what this is. How are you guys staying on top of that? So we're, our business, if, if I had to say one, like, what do we do in one word is interpretation. Mm. That's what we do, right? We don't solve any particular problem. We don't make a test. We don't, although we do all that, we have reports and tests, but what we truly do is interpret better, right? So we follow all the publications. We are constantly on PubMed and, you know, pulling things and learning things and tracking. Our science team is always saying, hey, look at this new publication about whatever, right? We then reinterpret that thing to make it actionable, to take it away from a, a genetic causation of, well, it looks like this gene may be causing something. We then start to look at the biochemistry that's wrapped around that and start to unpack what's going on. You know, simple thing like going back to estrogen toxicity that it's so much more prevalent in women. We found a publication that it's an, it's an epidemic in Canada, by the way, Lyme disease right now. And I know on the East Coast, the U.S. is a big problem. Huge. Uh, so there's this thing that came out that it's so much more prevalent in women. So that's where we start with, here's the publication, the evidence of something. Now we're going to figure out what's going on. And what do we figure out is that 30% of these women are being misdiagnosed. They don't even have Lyme disease. They're estrogen toxic. And the symptoms are all the same, but there's nothing in the toolkit that points to estrogen toxicity. They're not looking for that. So you, and it's not the clinician's fault, right? The clinicians, here's your bag of solutions. You have to ask questions to pick out which solution to pick, right? And, and this is your, you're limited to this bag. So all of a sudden Lyme disease is the only one that fit. So th that's the way we think. We, we, we pull the publications almost daily and we just try and reinterpret the way the body actually works. Then look at what genetics instruct all that stuff. And then all of a sudden we have a new solution for a problem. So when you're finding these solutions, and I know you guys have health coaches that are available to yeah. also help interpret that, what's the extent of involvement in that person's journey to, to health? And how are you working to, to work alongside maybe doctors that don't have this insight yet or don't speak the language or understand quite you know how to interpret this? So I think the, the doctor part to us was the most important uh, because what we, so I personally, in March of this year, spent the month talking to 60 functional doctors, one by one by one, to ask, and not to say, hey, we have something great, do you wanna buy it? But to ask them, why does genetics suck? Right, what's your problem? What, did, what, what do you want from this? And what, what did you expect? What was your experience? And the key thing it all came, kept coming back to is make it easy, mm. right? Easy to learn, easy to use, I don't need training, my staff doesn't need to spend their time, all that stuff, which I agree. If, and this is partly why genetics hasn't sort of uh, supported clinical work enough other than the genetic conditions, which are just a straight diagnosis, because the interpretation was difficult. A genetic testing company would give you a genetic report, here's your results. But if I didn't have the computer up here to understand the algorithm like our team does, then it, did, it wasn't actionable. It wasn't useful. And all of a sudden it was very underwhelming experience for the patient. So that's where we said that we got to get away from the genetics. That's what powers our insights. We got to speak to conditions. That's how clinicians think, right? Give me a lab report that tells me yes or no. And if it's what to do about it, even better. So that's what we did. We built the AI and artificial intelligence platform and our science team sat there and every this, the 6,000 people I talked about that we studied, we took the insights from those and plugged every single one in. And now all of a sudden, our reports don't speak to, here's your list of genes. We now have to train clinician how to use this thing. We're saying, you literally on day one, if you have some basic level experience, you can just read this document and sound like an expert. Right? The other thing we did is we created what we call a cheat sheet where to the consumer, we don't provide them clinical level guidance because there's no clinician in between. We give them, you know, sleep, lifestyle, exercise, diet, cardiovascular, some general stuff. Uh, but we're not saying we're kind of diagnosing you with fibromyalgia or we see breast cancer coming. We, we leave that to the clinicians. But for that, we created another algorithm, another AI that populates a clinical version, which goes straight to here's their red flags. Here's what we recommend for supplementation and even medication sometimes. 
and here's the lifestyle and environment recommendations because here's the load that would have caused the problem or could contribute, right? So all of a sudden, we, we do have training. We have a course that people like to take just for their own benefit, but you don't need it anymore. And that was the key. To the consumer, I would say it's a little bit of the same where the reports are self-navigable. Like you, if you have the document in front of you and you want to affect change, well, we hired Dr. BJ Fogg, who, who's the head of the Stanford University Behavioral Change Lab, to say, what are your insights? Here's the genetics. Here's the problem. How do we get people to actually change your behaviors to implement this stuff? So he built that into the reports. Very simple, easy ways to take tiny steps towards behavior change. Last layer to that, a lot of people need support. And it's not support of, I'm going to the doctor twice a year, and then in between, there's no one for me to talk to. This is where we think health coach, for behavior change, you need health coaching. Because you need accountability, someone to text and call, somebody calling you once a week, a regular ongoing appointment where there's homework and you know you have to get it done, right? That's how we found this sweet spot of a certain number of weeks where we can actually get someone to identify the red flag, figure out how to work on it, you know, kind of change their identity and come out of it a new person. Like they believe that this is what they always used to do, right? And that's how you deal with not masking a symptom with a pill, but changing the behavior so you're no longer on the path to that disease or condition. You're avoiding it now. That's what we do. Yeah, incredibly interesting because, uh, as we know, behavior is is so important to lead you back into a healthy state, and it's not just providing information. I think we yeah. have an abundance of information out there, almost too much for many people, and there's overwhelm, but they're not changing their behaviors based on information. So I think it's incredibly important. 